I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Jeffrey Christian, Managing Partner at CPM Group. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's good to be here. Yes, and we're here at VRIC. I believe last time we spoke was in September. It was right after the Barrick Rand Gold deal was announced, and we're here again, and there's another big gold deal announced last right. week. So I'm going to start off by asking, what are these transactions telling you about the gold market? What should we be taking away from the, these developments? Well, the gold market is looking like it's at its bottom. I mean, there, banks are getting out of the gold and commodities business. Institutional investors aren't doing anything in commodities. And the mining industry has been suffering a number of problems. I think these large mergers, the Barrick, Rand Gold, and now the Newmont Gold Corp, talk more about the gold mining industry than the gold market. Mm. You have gold, large gold mining companies that are very poorly structured, and they have a lot of issues in that they cannot find replacement reserves effectively, partly because of some of the management decisions over the last five to ten years. And those problems are coming home to roost. And the only way that they can hope to benefit is to merge with each other. Now, the Barrick Rand Gold made more sense probably than the Newmont Gold Corp one, uh, simply because Rand Gold had a positive production profile going forward uh, where Barrick didn't. And Newmont and Gold Corp both have the same problem. Are these good? Are these deals, are they good for investors? We have been telling investors, we don't talk about mining companies specifically mm -hmm. uh, in public, but we do advise individual high net worth and accredited investors and institutions. And we have been saying for many years that the best returns are at medium size and smaller mining companies mm -hmm. and emerging producers, and that the big guys really don't have the capacity to provide the kinds of profitability and returns and dividends that investors should see. Okay, and you, you actually just did a presentation here at VRIC on how investors should be looking at gold and silver investments, the metals, not the companies. Mm -hmm. And you really emphasize the looking at them as both short and long-term investments. I think a lot of people pretty much understand the long-term value, but can you talk right now about that short-term value that investors should be looking for and how what you are doing to right. help with that? Okay. Well, we've been doing this now for, you know, 35, 40 years. Yes. And the investors that we've seen who have done the best are long and short, and they're long-term and short-term. So they will own some precious metals as long-term insurance and portfolio diversifiers, but they'll also trade the metal. And a lot of smaller investors think that you just buy and hold this stuff forever. Mm -hmm. And you know the price rises very sharply and they're happy, and then the price falls back. That's because these are markets, and that's what markets do. It doesn't matter if it's a currency or a stock or a commodity, they, prices rise and fall. And if investors try to capture that up and down, they can earn better returns. Mm. So it seems pretty difficult if you're an individual investor trying to make those shorter term trends. It seems quite hard. So what I guess how what's the best way for them to right. do that? Yeah, I gave a talk here several years ago mm. about why 80% of the people who invest in gold and silver on a short-term basis through futures and options lose money. And part of it is that the gold, you know, if, if you're investing in a stock, there are stock market regulators who demand accuracy in the information that's published about that company. If you're investing in a bond, there's all kinds of data that you can analyze. But in commodities, they're totally unregulated. So you have a lot of really bad data that people produce and they say it's mm -hmm. this is what gold's doing or lithium or cobalt. Uh, and there's a lot of bad analysis and there's a lot of promotional information that's just simply inaccurate. And investors have to be able to discriminate 
good information from bad information mm. and you know say well wait a second that guy's been bullish for 40 years the fact that he's bullish today is meaningless to what the market is going to be doing here's a guy who's been bullish and bearish on and off what's his track record you know and you really have to you have to discriminate and as i said in my presentation you have to read for for comprehension not for confirmation of your beliefs Okay, so looking at another topic you covered, which was, I guess, the level of gold investment demand last year was quite low, but it played into some dynamics with central bank demand. Right. What can you what can you say further about well, that? Yeah, people were surprised that the gold price fell as sharply as it did in 2018. In retrospect, it makes sense because what was happening in 2018 was a lot of some some investors were selling. Uh, but a lot of other investors weren't buying. And net investment demand last year was 13.8 million ounces, which was the lowest level since 2000. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2000, we were at the bottom of a seven-year bear market. Uh, gold was $270 an ounce, and investors were convinced that you know the world would, was in a new economic paradigm where we'd never have inflation or recessions, and the Dow would go to 40,000, and there was no reason to own gold. Uh, and investors are buying that much gold this year, last year. You know, so investors have fled the gold market. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very bearish and it explains the price weakness. Central banks are more price sensitive than our private investors. Mm -hmm. And what we saw last year was that central banks stepped up their gold. They bought about 16.5 million ounces of gold, which was probably half again as high as in 2017, and three times what they had bought in 2015. That's because as the investors pulled back and the price fell, the central bank said, well, I didn't want to buy at 13, 13, 50, 1400, but if the price is 12 or 1240 or 1280, I'll buy. So central banks, because of their increased, greater price elasticity of their demand, have increased their gold purchases, and they probably will continue to stock up on gold until investors come back and bid the price up. Okay, so if investors are buying gold as they were in 2000, what does that tell us looking forward about where gold is going? Well, first off, yeah, they're buying the lowest level since 2000. They actually bought much, much less than 2000. Okay. But the fact that investment demand has fallen very low tells us that we're probably close to the bottom of, sure. of the market uh, because you're pretty much as negative as you can get in terms of investor attitudes toward gold at this point. And then if we're at the bottom, what starts to drive it up? Is right. it? Yes. The major factor is always exogenous to gold. So it's macroeconomic trends. Uh, international politics, domestic politics, financial market stability. And we're looking at a world where there are gathering problems in economics and politics and financial markets. But those problems haven't come home to roost yet. And then meanwhile, we've actually had a relatively good economy. Last year, last January when we were here, a lot of people were talking about the potential for a recession in 2018. In fact, we had very strong economic growth, not only in the U.S., but in Europe and in China, stronger than everybody expected at the beginning of the year. This year, it's going to be lower, but it's not probably going to be re recessionary. So what we're looking at is a world where gold doesn't necessarily rise sharply this year, but at some point, those bigger problems come home. So we're looking at specifically the debt market, sure. the housing market, the auto industry, and consumption, government debt, private debt, corporate debt, interest rates, the vulnerability of the stock market. We have a matrix of all of these things that we look at that we, we update on a monthly basis for our clients and on a daily basis mm -hmm. for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're waiting for some combination of those factors to trigger a wave of investment demand off of that 13.8 base over 20 million ounces toward the 30 or 40 million ounces that you saw consistently in the period from 2002 to 2012. And this will move the gold price. Do we see other precious metals go with it? I think that gold is probably the most attractive investment right now in terms of potential price appreciation going forward. 
I think gold's dynamics are better suited than silver. Silver has some structural issues that really uh, could keep it from rising as sharply as gold. Platinum has some issues. It probably is close to its base and will come off as you see substitution away from palladium into platinum and autocatalyst. And palladium is extremely expensive at this point. Okay, that was great. Um, as we wrap up, do you could you share your best piece of advice for investors in 2019? Well, I think my best piece of advice for gold and silver investors sure. is that you should own gold and silver as catastrophic insurance and as a long-term investment. You should probably trade the range. You shouldn't drink the Kool-Aid and listen. I mean, you've got guys here who have been bullish for 40 years and they've been right twice, you know, right. in, in that 40-year period. Don't expect gold and silver prices to skyrocket this year or maybe not even next year. But expect prices to rise sharply at some point when those economic and financial problems really start to hit home. Okay, that was great. Thank you so much. We'll leave it there. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Jeffrey Christian with CPS.